Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this one of the closing sessions at the ICS meeting, and it's a great pleasure to have three real experts in the field, Carl Eric Anderson, um, Chantal Dumelin, and Carl Dietrich Sievert, who are going to talk on diverse subjects, including the innovation and function of the urinary tract and how that might be modified, aspects of physiotherapy and the exciting new developments in that field, and then stem cell research that, that Carl Dietrich is going to deal with. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am going to discuss a little uh, alternative pharmacological targets, if we have any. And uh, I am just looking here to see where I am. Uh, I'm talking about potential targets and uh, what could be developed into drugs and also on how to optimize uh, the treatment alternatives we have. To start with, uh, two types of targets, and that is the ATP receptors. We all know that ATP plays an essential role in the activation of the bladder. And what about then uh, uh, um, uh, ATP, and particularly two P2X3 receptors? Are they useful? And then I will go on to talk about the trip channels. Among the uh, 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 um, uh, P2X, uh, P, P, uh, ATP receptors, the P2X receptors are, of course, the most interesting. And uh, um, I just wanted to go back here, but I can't do that. Yeah, well, the P2X3 receptor, as you know, it's located both in the urethelium <coughs> itself, but particularly on the suburethelial afferent nerves. And that's why we think that uh, interference with this particular receptor would be useful. And uh, it has, uh, there has been development going on for chronic pain and afferent sensitization in chronic pain. And also, uh, there are some preclinical background to, to motivate that we investigate the effect of P2X3 antagonist also in, in, in um, a, 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 a urinary tract disorders. The basis for it is that uh, um, if you knock out the P2X3 receptors, you can increase the uh, uh, intermictorition intervals in mice, you can increase the voided volumes, but you retain the pressure. So this is just to interfere with the afferent signaling. And uh, the developments uh, uh, have gone on now for 10 years. And this is, so far uh, we have come, this substance here, AF353, uh, seems to be useful in delaying uh, the, uh, 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 well, uh, decreasing frequency uh, without uh, um, uh, actually uh, influencing the contraction ability. And uh, uh, the mechanism is, uh, as expected, a decrease in uh, uh, afferent signaling. And particularly, uh, you, you can demonstrate that if you give the drug intravesically. But of course, we are planning to, to, to give the drug orally. And uh, today, there is no uh, clinical uh, data that actually supports that the principle actually works in the low urinary tract. Even if the uh, preclinical rationale is good, uh, we have a, a couple of good, promising drug candidates, but as I said, no clinical experiences have been published. What about the trip channels? There are a lot of trip channels in different parts of the uh, uh, bladder wall, and uh, well, this is just to, to the, uh, an overview. But if you look here, you can see that uh, in the urothelial cells, in both the A delta fibers and the C fibers and the detrusor muscle itself, you find different types of trip channels. The only trip channels for which we can actually say that there is proof of concept is, of course, the trip V1. We know that capsaicin and uh, resiniparatoxin works, and we know that uh, uh, there are small molecules that actually are able to block the uh, trip V1 receptors, 
And there is the drawback uh, that people hasn't uh, uh, overcome yet, and that is that all these small molecules actually increase body temperature. They do it uh, uh, to a small extent, but it has been considered a, a drawback. So the development uh, uh, in this particular area has been slowed down, and I don't uh, know, some of them, ha uh, some areas also have stopped. So there are promising animal data for these small trip V1 uh, uh, channel antagonists, but we actually do not know whether or not they work in human uh, uh, overactive bladder. The problems with hypothermia has not been overcome, but there is a potential for further development. There have been some interest in the uh, a, a, a cannabinoid system and also a road kinase. This is old uh, interest and have been going on for, for uh, more than 10 years. And we have uh, uh, the different stimulators and antagonists of uh, uh, the cannabinoid receptors, but we have also the uh, uh, fatty acid uh, amino uh, hydro, uh, hydrolase inhibitors that breaks down the endocannabinoids and inhibitors of those have shown some promise in animal experiments, as, as I can show. CB2 receptors, for example, can be located both to the urothelium, as you can see in uh, panel C here, and in the lamina propria, uh, on the suburothelial nerves. So the center uh, is actually uh, uh, the right one. And uh, what is the clinical evidence for an effect? Well. There are some uh, preliminary data showing that cannabinoids uh, 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 have a clinical effect on incontinence episode, particularly in patients with MS, but that's it. So what else we have is based on animal experiments. And uh, here is the location of the um, fatty acid amide hydrolase, and, and as I said, uh, that breaks down the endocannabinoids, and uh, it seems that they have some uh, effect if you give inhibitors in, in a, a rat cystometry. You can see that, that uh, you can inhibit the effect of these inhibitors, in this particular inhibitors, uh, OETA, with uh, um, a, a, a CB2 antagonist, which would indicate that the CB2 receptor is the actual target that we have to hit to get a clinical effect, if possible. And uh, the same here, you can see that uh, uh, you have a, a, a good effect, at least in rat cystometry, which is not directly predictive on an effect in, in the clinic. This may be more relevant that you actually can inhibit afferent signaling by this FAA inhibitor. And uh, uh, to uh, summarize what, where we are just now, is that we have somewhat promising preliminary human data, but that's not enough to say that the principle actually works. And we have promising animal data, and there should be a potential for further development, even if it's not too uh, exciting, I would say. So then the rho kinase inhibitors. We have uh, had uh, great hopes for, for that because we had some signals in the clinic that one of, of uh, the uh, substances uh, that is uh, actually a, a derivative of vi uh, vitamin D uh, uh, and uh, showed to be a rho kinase inhibitor, and that had some effect in a placebo-controlled double-blind three-month trial. And, uh, uh, well, the thing come to an end uh, when the uh, company closed down and there have been no further developments. So that's for, uh, there have been no uh, quite recent interesting experiments showing that, uh, as you can see here to the upper left panel, you see those small contractions uh, and they can be inhibited and then you can increase bladder compliance and this is in principle, the same type of effect you see with beta-3 agonists, and that has renewed the interest of the, for these uh, rho kinase inhibitors. And it's the same here, that you can see the, that if you add 
uh, aerokinase inhibitor, you can uh, 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 reduce the spontaneous contractions you see in isolated uh, uh, detrusor uh, from obstructed animals. But um, the preliminary human data we have uh, uh, is not uh, uh, from the low urinary tract. It's only that uh, uh, some of those rokinase inhibitors can be tolerated, but there is no recent information. And uh, uh, we have this new interesting animal results, but we don't really know if there is a potential for further developments. And then we come to the brain. Of course, this is where we had great hopes also some years ago. Uh, with the uh, uh, um, uh, reuptake inhibitors of 5-hydroxy well, 5-HT and uh, noradrenaline uptake inhibitors, of course, of the opioids, gabapentin analogs, NK1 receptor antagonists, and so on. And there are some principles that seem to work, but everything we have had so far tested in humans have had low efficacy or unacceptable side effects. There is a great potential for further development, but there doesn't seem to be anybody who is, a, who is willing to, to, to do that development. So how could we actually do something to optimize our treatment involving drugs? Of course, we can individual, individualize treatment. We all already do that uh, with the drugs we have. Uh, with the uh, anti-mascarinics, beta-3 agonist, and even with Botox. We can, of course, uh, uh, resume to combination therapy. Uh, one uh, way to go is to subcategorize the OIB population, maybe use of biomarkers, but uh, also uh, we have to look for new alternatives and new strategies. And one of the things that could be of interest is, of course, combination therapy. And that has been discussed, and many uh, 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 trials are ongoing with different uh, uh, combinations between existing drugs, but also with the addition of uh, 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 drugs. But there is another possibility, that, which I think uh, may be promising, and that is to combine drug therapy with neuromodulation. This is based on uh, studies uh, in cats uh, where we have foot stimulation corresponding to tibial nerve stimulation. And some of the drugs here have been tested. For example, tolteridine, duloxetine, and tramadol. These drugs may not be per se particularly active. And we also have heard, uh, heard a lot of, uh, about uh, um, tibial nerve stimulation now. Uh, that it is maybe most suitable for mild OAB cases. But if you combine it with drug, maybe we have a new opportunity because there are two different ways of stimulating or antagonizing afferent activity. And, and uh, maybe the uh, electrical stimulation and uh, uh, the drug effects uh, could mean that we could introduce low efficacy drug, take some of the drugs that have not a direct effect by themselves, combine it with electrical stimulation, and we may have a useful therapy. So to summarize, we have several unexplored targets. And for some drugs, we have promising animal data. But the translation to a clinical use is slow. We don't have any promising drug in the pipeline just now, and we'd, uh, we, it's not difficult to predict that there will be no new drugs in the market uh, in the next five-year period. Looks a little dark, I must say. But maybe that combination therapy is an alternative for improved effects in this area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Carl Eric. Do you want to stay up at the microphone? I think we'll take the questions with each talk because they're quite divergent, the topics. Any questions from the floor? I mean, you, you mention and emphasize quite rightly the importance of combination, and indeed with botulinum toxin, we often use anti when it's wearing off and so on. So it's a very logical approach to do that. 
But you mentioned a number of other potential targets and promising models. Do you want to comment on that? Because animal models aren't predictive of outcome. And what would you think as being the most promising of these targets? Because many of these have been around for some time. Yeah, well, I would think that if we can combine uh, um, drugs with central mode of action, with drugs that actually have a peripheral effect on afferent signaling from the bladder. So that we have two levels, the uh, uh, signaling from the bladder and the handling of the afferent uh, signal in the brain. Then we m should have a potential to have a better effect uh, than we have today with the, uh, because all the drugs we have, beta-3 agonists, antimascarinics, even botulinum toxin, uh, the main action for these three uh, types of drugs is uh, that they decrease afferent activity uh, 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 to the brain. So if we could actually add to that uh, an effect at another level, uh, how the, uh, this afferent information is handled at the central level, we uh, would have theoretically at least a good chance to get a better uh, drug therapy. Thank you. Any other comments? I mean, how do you reconcile the potential for adverse events with a centrally acting drug action with the efficacy? Because hasn't that been a problem in the past? Yes, yeah, since th these drugs have been shown to be effective, take for example the NK1 receptor antagonist, their side effect profile was acceptable, but the efficacy was low. It was lower than that with tolteridine. But if you add another type of, of, of uh, uh, inhibitory uh, principle, that may be uh, 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 possible to, 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 to develop to something useful. Carl Dietrich. You mentioned the inhibitors like deloxetine. Can we switch the microphone on, please? You mentioned the uh, deloxetine as one of the inhibitors. My question would be, expect if you combine them with neuromodulation that you can have a good effect with lower drug um, amount you have to t intake yeah, that, was the, uh, that was the idea you know as far as I uh, as well as I do that the loxetine uh, main uh, disadvantage is the side effect and uh, it is effective in OAB but to a high price if you can well half the dose add, for example, electrical stimulation, maybe it could be useful. I mean, these are fields for further investigations. That is what I was talking about. <laughs> well, I think it is a very interesting thing, and we all can look into that very easily because we have those patients. Mm. Okay, thanks very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, thank colleague. You.